Section 5 of The Pastor's Wife by Elizabeth von Arnim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5. Chapter 11. And so it came to pass that Herr Dremmel, armed only with simplicity, set aside the resistances of princes, potentates, and powers and was married to Ingeborg by her father, the bishop, in his own cathedral. And it was done as quickly as the law allowed, not only because Herr Dremmel was determined it should be, but because the enduring of his daily arrival for courting purposes from Coops, where he was staying, became rapidly impossible for the bishop. Also there was the master of Ananias, spurred to a frenzy of activity by Herr Dremmel's success in getting things hurried on, insisting that he had been engaged long enough, and demanding to be married on the same day. In the end he was, and Ingeborg's wedding, being Judith's as well, was unavoidably splendid. All along the line the bishop's hand was forced, the very wedding dress, had to be as beautiful for the one as for the other of his daughters. And absurdly and wickedly he was obliged to spend as much on her trousseau who was going into pauperdom and obscurity for the rest of her days as on hers who would no doubt be soon, though of course only in God's good time, the most magnificent of widows. He never afterwards was able to feel quite the same to the duchess without knowing anything of the circumstances of the secret disgrace of the affair of the blank undesirability in any case of such a son-in-law of the extraordinary inconvenience and pecuniary loss of ingeborg's marrying at all she had taken up herr dremmel to an extent that was positively near making her ridiculous, supposing that, humanly speaking, were possible, and had rammed him down the county's throat, till at last it believed that of the two husbands Ingeborg had secured the better. And this gossip filtered through into the palace, and Judith, who never did speak, spoke less than ever but edging away more and more decidedly from the blandishments of the master, who had not been invited to Coops, spent most of her time in her own room engaged in not looking at her trousseau, and the palace became such an uncomfortable place, what with one thing and another, and the strain of remaining calm and becoming in conduct to the duckily protected Herr Dremmel, was so great that at last the bishop was as eager as any one to get the wedding over and feverishly furthered any scheme that would, by hastening it, deliver him. To Ingeborg he never spoke, but turned away with the same cold horror that came over the rest of the family when from windows he or it beheld her being quartered with what seemed a terrible German thoroughness in places like the middle of the lawn. He could no longer walk round his own garden without meeting an interlaced couple, and though he suggested to Herr Dremmel, with what he felt was really admirable self-restraint, that these public endearments might give rise to comment, Herr Dremmel merely replied that, as Ingeborg was his brout, it ought to give rise to much more comment, even to justifiable complaints, if his manner to her were less warm. "'In England we do not,' began the bishop, but broke off for fear of losing his self-restraint, and Herr Dremmel and Ingeborg, continuing to perambulate the garden slowly with a frequent readjusting of their steps to each other's, for it is a difficult method, the interlaced one, of getting along a path, the bishop and Mrs. Bullivant, 
retreated for refreshment and comfort to the delicacy of judith to her lovely withdrawals that the master should blandish was natural because a man is natural but they knew that a woman if she is to approach any ideal of true womanhood cannot be too carefully unnatural and should she be persuaded or betrayed into some expression of affection for her lover some answering caress at least she must not like it and there was ingeborg progressing round the garden as described or in the middle of the lawn openly having her hand held and looking pleased it was rank ingeborg in fact was pleased she was more she was extremely happy here she was suddenly no longer a disgraced and boycotted and wicked girl but that strangely encouraging object that odd restorer of faith in oneself a little sugar lamb the coziness of being a sugar lamb she had been so very miserable she had dragged through such cold anemic days she had had such a horrible holiday forced upon her on the very scene of her activities and had had it brought home to her so freezingly so blightingly that she had done too dreadful a thing to be allowed apparently ever again to associate with the decent and robert she quickly began calling him that to herself under the influence of her family's methods of reclaiming her had not written a single letter but he came said herr dremmel for whose enlightenment she was picturing the week she had had and her father would not speak to her at all would not look at her old sheep said herr dremmel good-naturedly and judith had seemed entirely horrified and used to blush if she tried to speak to her foolish turkey said herr dremmel placidly but now somehow it did seem as if she needn't have been quite so miserable and might have had more faith what ought the little one to have had more of asked herr dremmel for his thoughts had not much time to spare and he profitably employed them while she talked in working out the probable results of say the treatment of three acres of sugar-beet with sulphate of potash sulphate of ammonia and nitrate of soda respectively all of them receiving four hundred pounds of basic slag as well would not sulphate of ammonia be more effective as a nitrogenous manure than nitrate of soda in the case of sugar-beets whose roots grew smaller and nearer the surface than mangles that is what little women should constantly have more of he said breaking away from sugar beets to a zestful embracing for on this occasion they were under the pear tree a place she seldom went to because she had not yet acquired in spite of his assurances that she undoubtedly would any real enthusiasm for embracings keeping by preference to the only immune place in the garden which was the middle of the lawn i wonder she thought while it was being done if this will really grow on me and while it was still being done mother must have been kissed too and she's still alive and presently while it was still being done but mother isn't much alive there's the sofa perhaps that's why well he loved her somehow she did not now care how whether it was a spiritual affection or one that would go on requiring at frequent intervals to enfold her capaciously did not matter any more for it was a warm thing a warm human thing he was offering her and she had been half dead with cold what did it matter if she herself was not in love it was the dream of a schoolgirl to want to be in love 
Life was not like that. Life was a thing full of friendliness and happy affection, and love, anyhow, on the woman's side, was not a bit necessary. The bishop would have been surprised if he had known how nearly she approached his ideal of womanhood. She was going to be so good, she said to herself, and to Herr Dremmel, too, her heart full of gratitude and glad relief. Oh, so good! She was never going to be dejected or beaten out of hope and courage again. She would work over there, work hard at all sorts of happy things in the parish, and among the poor and sick, and she would help Robert in his work, if he would let her, and if he wouldn't, then she'd help him when he had done, help him to play and rest. They would laugh together, and talk together, and walk together, and he would explain his experiments to her, and teach her to understand. And the first thing she would do would be to learn German very thoroughly, so as to be able to write all his letters for him, and even his sermons if needs be, and save his precious time. Those, said Herr Dremmel, who in the lush meadows of dalliance had forgotten that what had first attracted him to her had been a certain bright baldness of brain, would be pretty little nonsense sermons the small snail would produce. You'll see, said Ingeborg confidently, and she suddenly flung out her arms and turned her face up to the sun and the blue through the little leaves and all the light and promise of the world and stretched herself in an immense contentment oh she sighed isn't it all good isn't it all good it is agreed herr dremmel but it is nothing to how good it will be presently when we are surrounded by our dear children children said ingeborg she dropped her arms and looked at him. She had not thought of children. Then, indeed, my little wife will not wish to write letters or compose sermons. Why? said Ingeborg. Because you will be a happy mother. But don't happy mothers. You will be entirely engaged in adoring your children. Nothing else in the world will interest you. Ingeborg stood looking at him with a surprised face. Oh, she said, shall I? Then she added, but I've never had any children. It was not to be expected, said Herr Dremmel. Then how do you know nothing else in the world will interest me? Foolish little one, he said, taking her in his arms, his eyes moist with tenderness, for he knew that here against his breast he held in her slender youth the mother of all the Dremmels, and the knowledge profoundly moved him. Foolish little one is not throughout all nature every mother solely preoccupied by interest in her young. Is she? said Ingeborg doubtfully, quite a number of remembered family snapshots dancing before her eyes. Still she was very willing to believe. She looked at him a moment, thinking. But, she said gently, pushing herself a little away from him, both hands on his chest, but what then, small snail? Wouldn't they be German children? Undoubtedly, said Herr Dremmel proudly. All of them? All of them, he echoed. It wouldn't be like Roman Catholics and Protestants marrying, and half the children be German and half English. "'Certainly not,' said Herr Dremmel emphatically. "'But, Robert, continue, little Herr. "'What are German children like?' "'It was now Herr Dremmel's turn to say confidently, "'You'll see.' "'A week later they were married, "'and the bishop, inscrutably watching Ingeborg from the doorstep, "'as she was being tucked by deft hands into the rugs of the car, that was to take her to the station, observing how cushions were put in the right places at her back, how a footstool was carefully inserted under her feet, 
how her least movement was interpreted and instantly attended to made his farewell remark to his daughter the last remark as it happened that he ever did make to her you will miss wilson he said and re-entered the palace a slightly comforted man she never saw him again part two chapter twelve on her honeymoon which was only as long as it took to get from redchester to conkensee except for a day in holland where a brief and infinitely respectful visit or rather waiting on was made to the eminent de vries ingeborg said to herself at frequent intervals as she had said to herself under the pear-tree in what now seemed a remote past perhaps this will grow on me but even before they reached Cokensee, on the fourth day after their marriage she was deciding though a little reluctantly for she had always heard them praised that probably she had no gift for honeymoons robert luckily was apparently liking his and was quite happy and placid and slept sonorously in the trains the meals were invariably cheerful from bromberg as he woke up and became attentive to the country they were passing through and once in his own part of the world he expanded into much talk pointing out and explaining the distinctive features of the methods employed on the different farms along the line ingeborg drank it in eagerly she was zealous to learn resolute to be a help meet had he not delivered her from the immense suffocation of redchester she was obsequious with gratitude it was a country of an exhilarating spaciousness no hedges no shutting off of one field from another no shutting off indeed of the sky itself or of the blue delicious distance by little interfering hills like those they had round redchester it was all one great sweep one great roll of earth up to heaven and of heaven down to earth fresh and free and with a quality in the air of clear bright hardness she thought adorable after the wadded effect of the climate at home and once when the train pulled up in the open she could hear from far away up in the blue the cry of a hawk from allenstein they went on by a light railway with toy carriages and a tiny engine through an affinity of rye-fields and seemingly uninhabited country to the nearest station to Cokensee, a place called Muck, of some pretension to being a little town with an enormous church rising out of its middle and containing among other objects of interest explained herr dremmel his mother oh said ingeborg surprised have you got one for he somehow produced a completely motherless impression invariably my treasure said herr dremmel with patience do people have mothers yes she said reaching down his hat for him and putting it carefully on his head but then they say so perhaps sooner or later i well remember however informing you that my father was dead from that it was possible to reason that my mother was not she is a simple woman no longer young we will visit her on her way through the town outside the station a high vehicle drawn by two long-tailed horses one of which reached a head and a neck further than the other so that when you looked at them sideways and could not see that they both began at the same place it seemed to be perpetually winning a race was in readiness to take them to Cokensee. this said herr dremmel introducing it with a wave of the hand is my carriage and this he continued similarly introducing the driver is my faithful servant johann he has been with me now nearly a year ingeborg shook johann's hand 
when he had carefully clambered down over the sacks of canit that filled the front part of the carriage very politely do they all stay as long as that she murmured to herr dremmel all there is but my widow and she is adjusting her feathers for flight she will wing her way to some other bachelor nest as soon as my little one has been inducted but does she like that asked ingeborg for she had acquired a habit due to much repetition of the litany of regarding widowers as brittle needing special care there was an instant's vision before her eyes of this one flapping blackly athwart the fields of east prussia turned out desolate and oppressed and with perhaps some cackling trail of curses stridulously marking her course no doubt she will feel it she too has been very faithful she has been with me now nearly eight months but if it were less she would still feel it widows he continued abstractly peering among the stacks of kynet in search of some chilla saltpetre that was not there are in a constant condition of feeling johann explained he was a shabby man grown grey and frayed ingeborg supposed in service that the previous stuff did not seem to have caught its train and herr dremmel went off to make anxious inquiries of the station-master while ingeborg stood smiling with an excessive friendliness at johann to make up for her want of words and wondering how her luggage would get on to a carriage already so much occupied by sacks in the end most of it did not and was left at the station till some future time and clutching her dressing-bag with one hand and the iron rail of the carriage with the other she was rattled away over the enormous cobbles of muck with a great crackling of johann's whip and barking of dogs and kickings of the horses whose tails were long and kept on getting over the reins the planks of the carriage's bottom heaved and yawned beneath her feet the horses shied in and out of the gutters her hat wanted to blow off and she did not dare let either of her hands go free to hold it she bent her head to try to keep it on her skin pricked and tingled from the shaking she had an impression of red houses flush with the street railless dwellings giving straight on to it of a small shop or two of people stopping to stare of straw and paper and dust dancing together in the wind herr dremmel chose these flustered moments to expand conversationally and raising his voice above the tumult explained in shouts that the three sacks in front were not so much stacks as mysterious stomachs filled with the future she strained to catch what he said but only heard a word now and then when she bumped against him divine maws richly furnished banquet potential energy she found it difficult to answer with any sort of connected intelligence more especially because he kept on breaking off to lean forward and hit the horseflies that alighted on the back of johann's neck when he did this johann started and the horses kicked faithful servant he shouted in her ear nearly a year must not be stung it was a disorganized and breathless ingeborg trying to rub things out of her eyes who found herself finally in the passage of the elder frau dremmel's house a door stood ajar and her husband pushed it open and called loudly on his mother to appear she lurks she lurks he said impatiently looking at his watch and redoubled his cries does she expect us asked ingeborg at last 
who was trying to pin up her loosened hair. She is a simple woman, he said, consequently she never expects anything. And he pulled open a door out of which came nothing but darkness and a great cold smell. That is not my mother, he said, shutting it again. Does she know we're coming home today? Asked Ingeborg, a doubt beginning to take hold of her. She is a simple woman. Consequently, she never knows anything. Mother, mother! Does she know you're married? Asked Ingeborg, the doubt growing bigger. She is a simple woman. Consequently, he broke off and stared down at her reflecting. Is it possible that I forgot to tell her? He said. It evidently was possible, for at that moment Frau Dremmel came slowly up some steps at the beginning of the passage from a lower region, and perceiving her son, and a strange young woman, stood still, and said nothing whatever. "'Mother, this is my wife,' said Herr Dremmel, taking Ingeborg's hand, and leading her to the motionless figure. "'Ach!' said Frau Dremmel, without moving. "'Kiss her, little one,' directed Herr Dremmel. "'Yes, yes,' said Ingeborg, blushing a vivid red, and going a convulsive step nearer. Frau Dremmel was regarding her with sombre, unblinking eyes, eyes that had the blankness of pebbles. From her waist downwards she wore a big dark blue apron. She was entirely undecorated. Her black dress ended at the neck abruptly in its own binding and a hook and eye. Her hair was drawn back into the smallest of knobs. Ingeborg felt suddenly that she herself was a thing of falals, a showy thing. Bedizened with a white collar and a hat, she had till then considered neat, but that she now knew for a monstrous piece of frippery, crushed on to insufficiently pinned-up hair. "'You are married to her?' asked the elder Frau Dremmel, turning her pebble eyes slowly from one to the other. "'Undoubtedly,' said Herr Dremmel, and to Ingeborg in English, "'Kiss her, little one, and we will go on home.' He himself put his arm around his mother's shoulder and gave her a hasty kiss. "'My wife is English,' he said. "'She does not yet either speak or understand our tongue. "'Kiss her, mother, and we will go on home.' but it did not seem possible to get the two women to kiss. Ingeborg went another shy step nearer. Frau Dremmel remained immobile. This, said Frau Dremmel, moving her slow eyes over Ingeborg, and then fixing them on her son, is a pastor's wife? Undoubtedly. I regret I omitted to tell you, mother, but one does occasionally omit and in English to Ingeborg. She is a simple woman, consequently. But I heard, said Frau Dremmel, through your housekeeper and others, thus I heard, of my only son's marriage. I, a widow. Ingeborg, not understanding, stood smiling nervously. She thought, on such an occasion, somebody ought to smile, but she did not like doing it. The immobility of Frau Dremmel, who moved nothing but her eyes, the dank bare passage, the rush of cold smell that had escaped out of the one door in it, the bleak air of poverty about her mother-in-law, the poverty in some strange way regarding itself as virtuous for no reason except that it was poor, did not make her smiling easy. But she was a bride, just coming home, just being introduced to her husband's people. Somebody, she felt, on such an occasion must smile, and, trained as she had been by her father to do the things no one else wanted to do, she provided all the smiling for the homecoming entirely herself. "'Please, Robert, tell your mother how sorry I am I can't talk,' she said. Do tell her I wish I weren't so dumb. How much has she? Frau Dremmel was asking across 
this speech. Enough, enough, said her son, putting on his hat, and making movements of departure. Ah, I am not to know more secrets. It is all to go in further unchristian tampering with God's harvests. Herr Dremmel bestowed a second abstracted kiss somewhere on his mother's head. He had not listened to anything she said for a quarter of a century. Nothing for the mother, she went on. No, no, the mother is only a widow. She is of no account. Yet your sainted father— Farewell, and God be with you, said Herr Dremmel, departing down the passage, and forgetting in his hurry to get his bride home as quickly as possible to take her with him. For a moment she was left alone, confronting her new relation. She made a great plunge into filialness, and, swiftly blushing, picked up her mother-in-law's passive hand. She had meant to kiss it, but looking into her eyes she found kissing finally impossible. She shyly murmured an English leave-taking, and got herself infinitely awkwardly out of the house. One has to have them, was Herr Dremmel's only comment. Kokensee lay three miles along the high road between Muck and Weisenhausen and they could see the spire of its little church over the fields on the left the whole way the road made with as few curves as possible undulated gently up and down between the rye fields it was carefully planted on each side with mountain ashes on that day in full flower and was white and hard as though there had been no rain for a long while the wind blew gaily over the rye. The sky was flecked with small white clouds. Ingeborg could see for miles. And there were dark lines of forest and flashes of yellow where the broom grew. And shining bits of water. And larks quivering out joy. And everywhere on the higher places busy windmills and the whole world seemed to laugh and flutter and sing it's beautiful oh beautiful she said beautiful i tell you what is beautiful little one the fat red soil of your girlhood's home the fat red soil and the steady drip drip of the heavens and he bent forward and inquired of johann when it had rained last and became very gloomy on hearing that it was three weeks ago and said things to himself in german they seemed to be unpastoral things for ingeborg saw johann's ears lifted up by what was evidently in front of his face being a grin a weather-beaten signpost with one bent arm pointed crookedly down a field track at right angles to the road, and with a lurch and a heave they tilted round the corner. There was an immediate ceasing of sound. She could now hear all sorts of little birds singing besides larks, chaffinches, tits, yellow hammers, black caps. The carriage ploughed along slowly through the deep sand, between rye that grew more reluctantly every yard. The horses were completely sobered and covered with sweat. Before them, on an upward slope, was Kokensee, one long straggling street of low cottages lying up against the sunset, its church behind it, and near the church two linden trees, which were the trees she knew, for she had often made him tell her in front of her home ingeborg felt a quick tug at her heart here was the place containing all her future there was nothing left to her to feel she supposed that she would not feel here the years lay spread out before her spacious untouched canvases on which she was presently going to paint the picture of her life 
it was to be a very beautiful picture she said to herself with an extraordinary feeling of proud confidence not beautiful because of any gifts or skill of hers for never was a woman more giftless but because of all the untiring little touches the ceaseless care for details the patient painting out of mistakes and every touch and every detail was going to be aglow with the bright colours of happiness exulting bits out of the prayer-book the book she knew altogether best sang in her ears lift up your hearts we lift them up to the lord our god oh the beautiful words the beautiful world the wonder and the radiance of life when the devil said herr dremmel who had been scanning the crops on either side of the track with deepening depression took our saviour up on to a high place to tempt him with the offer of the kingdoms of the earth he was careful to hide cocency by keeping his tail spread out over it it was so ugly and so undesirable oh the devil said ingeborg shrugging her shoulder in a splendid contempt her face still shining with what she had been thinking she turned to him and laughed you can't expect devils to know what's what she said slipping her hand through his arm and throwing up her head in a kind of proud glee he smiled down at her little treasure he said for a moment becoming conscious that this was a very bright thing he had got and was bringing home with him the carriage was hauled up through an opening between two cottages out of the sand onto the stones of the village street by a supreme last effort of the horses and was dragged in great bumps across various defects through an open gate on the opposite side there was a yard with sheds a plough a manure heap some geese some hens a pig the two linden trees and in between the linden trees behind wire netting a one-storied house with a venerable bungalow which herr dremmel on their drawing up in front of it introduced to her my house he said with a wave of the hand chapter thirteen there followed a time of surprising happiness for ingeborg it was the happiness of the child escaped from its lessons and picnicking gloriously in freedom and unrebukedness the widow it is true slightly smudged the brightness of the beginning by as it were dying hard her body clung to life the life she had known she lamented for eight long months she was the last she explained of herr pastor's widows who reached back in a rusty row to the days when he first came elastic with youth to cure the souls of cocency and as she had stayed the longest it was clear she must be the best she remained at the parsonage dingily persistent for several days on the pretext of initiating ingeborg into the ways of the house and each time herr dremmel who seemed a little shy of embarking on controversy with her mentioned trains she burst in his presence into prayer and implored aloud on his behalf that he might never know what it was to be a widow she did ultimately however become dislodged and once she was gone there was nothing but contentment ingeborg was young enough to think the almost servantless housekeeping a thing of charm and humour herr dremmel was of the easiest unconcern as to what or when or if he ate it was early summer and there was only delight in getting up at dawn and pottering about the brick-floored kitchen before the daily servant came a girl known to kokensy as muller's ilsa and heating water and making coffee and preparing a very clean little breakfast table somewhere in the garden and decorating it with freshly picked flowers and putting the butter on young leaves 
and arranging the jar of honey so that a shaft of sunlight between the branches shone straight through it turning it into a miracle of golden light it was the sort of breakfast table one reads about in story-books and on its fragility herr dremmel would presently descend like some great geological catastrophe and the whole in a few convulsed moments would be just crumbs and coffee stains then he would put on leggings and go off with johann to his experimental fields and she would give herself up eagerly to the duties of the day she could not talk at first to ilsa a square girl with surprisingly thick legs because though she went about always with a german grammar in one hand she found that what she had learned was never what she wanted to say ilsa whose skirt was short did not wear stockings and when ingeborg by pointing and producing a pair had conveyed to her that it would be well if she did ilsa raised her voice and said that she had no money to get a husband with but at least the gutzel dank she had these two fine legs and if the frau pastor demanded that she should be hiding them give up her chances then frau pastor had best seek some girl on whom they grew crooked or lean and who for those reasons would only be too glad to cover them up ingeborg not understanding a word but apprehending a great objection smiled benevolently and put the stockings away and ilse's legs went on being bare they worked together in great harmony for there could be no argument cut off from conversation they sang and ingeborg sang hymns because her memory was packed with them and ilse sang long loud ballads going through them slowly verse by verse in a sort of steady howl the very geese paused on their way to the pond to listen anxiously dinner which ingeborg found convenient to prepare entirely in one pot simmered placidly on the stove from twelve o'clock onwards anybody who was hungry went and ate it you threw in potatoes and rice and bits of meat and carrots and cabbages and fat and salt and there you were what are these mysterious difficulties of housekeeping she asked herself that people shake their heads over her dinners were wholesome always delicious if one were hungry and quite amazingly hot they stayed hot as persistently as poultices and once when ilsa had the misfortune to be stung by a wasp on one of her admirable legs ingeborg with immense presence of mind seized the dinner and emptying it into a fair linen cloth bound it over the swollen place so that when herr dremmel arrived as it happened hungrily that day about two o'clock and asked for his dinner he was told it was on ilse's leg and had to eat sandwiches he could not but admire the resourcefulness of ingeborg but it was not until he had eaten several sandwiches that he was able still to say as he patted her shoulder little treasure it was the busiest happiest time every minute of the day was full it was life at first hand not drained dry of its elemental excellences by being squeezed first through the medium of servants to have a little kitchen all to yourself to be really mistress of every corner of your house to watch the career of your food from its very beginning to run out into the garden and pull up anything you happened to want to stand at the back door with your skirt full of grain and call your own chickens round you and feed them to go yourself and look for eggs to fill the funny little dark rooms with flowers and measure the stone-floored passage for a drugget you would presently order 
in the only carpet shop you had faith in which was the one in redchester what pleasures did the world contain that could possibly come up to these things were a little untidy but what did that matter it was possible to become the slave of things possible to miss life in preparation for living and the weather was so beautiful at least ingeborg thought it was there was the hottest sun and the coolest wind and bright clear-skied starry nights it is true robert when he scanned the naked heavens the last thing at night and peered at the thermometer outside his window the first thing in the morning said it was the devil's own weather and that if there was not soon some rain all his fertilizers all his activities all his expenditure would be wasted but though this would throw a shadow for a moment across her joy in each new wonderful morning she found it impossible not to rejoice in the light out in the garden for instance down there beyond the lime trees at the end where you could stand in the gap in the lilac hedge and look straight out across the rye fields the immense unending rye fields dipping and rising delicate grey delicate green shining in sunlight dark beneath a cloud restlessly waving on and on till over away at the end of things they got to the sky and were only stopped by brushing up against it out there with one's hand shading one's eyes from the too great brightness who could find fault with anything who could do anything but look and see that it was all very good oh but it was good it made one want to sing the te deum or the magnificat or still better that hymn of exultation we praise thee we bless thee we worship thee we glorify thee we give thanks to thee for thy great glory whenever there was a spare half hour such as between where dinner ended and tea began she would run out to the lime trees and pacing up and down that leafy place with the gooseberry bushes and vegetables and straggling accidental flowers of the garden lying hotly in the sun between her and the back of the house she learned german words by heart she learned them aloud from her grammar saying them over and over again glibly mechanically while her thoughts danced about the future from the immediate future of what she would do to-morrow the future of an afternoon in the punt among the reeds and perhaps paddling along to where the forest began to the more responsible vaguer future of further down the months when armed with german she would begin among the poor and go out into the parish and make friends with the peasants and be a real pastor's wife particularly she wished to get nearer her mother-in-law it seemed to her to be her first duty to get near her ceaselessly she trotted up and down repeating the german for giants umbrellas keys spectacles wax fingers thunder beards princes boats and shoulders ceaselessly her lips moved while her eyes followed the movements of the birds darting in and out of the lilac hedge and hopping among the crumbs where breakfast had been and through her giant's umbrellas keys spectacles and wax she managed not to miss a word the yellow hammers were chirping to each other in cheerful strophe and antistrophe a little bit of bread and no cheese a little bit of bread and no cheese at four she would go in and make some coffee by the simple method of uniting the coffee to hot water and leaving them to settle down together on the mat outside the laboratory's locked door herr dremmel did not wish to be disturbed once he was in there and she would steal down the passage on tiptoe biting her under lip in the intentness of her care 
that no rattling of the things on the tray should reach his ears. When he was in the house all singing ceased. She arranged that Ilsa should do her outdoor duties then, clean out the hen-house, milk the cow, whether it wanted to be milked or not, and minister to the pig. Johann was away all day at the experiment ground, and Ilsa waded about the farmyard mess with her bare legs, thoroughly enjoying herself, for no one ever scolded her whatever she did, and the yard was separated from the village street only by a low fence, and the early manhood of Kokensee, as it passed, could pause and lean on this, and learn from her manner of solacing the pig the comfortableness of the solacements awaiting her husband. At seven Ilsa went home, and Ingeborg prepared a supper so much like breakfast that nobody could have told it was evening or not morning, except that the ray of sunshine fell through the honey from the west instead of the east, and there was cheese. At this meal Herr Dremmel, full of his fertilizers, was mostly in a profound abstraction. He drank the coffee with which he was becoming saturated, and ate great slices of bread and cheese in an impenetrable silence. Ingeborg sat throwing crumbs to the birds, and watching the sky at the edge of the world grow first a mighty red, then fade, then light up into clear green, and long after the shadows beneath the lime trees were black, and the stars and the bats were out, and the frogs down in the reeds of the lake, and the occasional creaking of the village pump were all that one could hear outside the immense stillness, they would go on sitting there, Herr Dremmel silently smoking, Ingeborg silently making plans. Sometimes she would get up and cross over to him, and bend her face down close to his, and try in the dark to explore his eyes with hers. The noise you make, she would say, brushing a kiss, so much used does marriage make one to what once has seemed impossible, across the top of his hair and he would wake up and smile and pat her shoulder and tell her she was a good little wife. Then she felt proud. It was just what she wanted to be a good little wife. She wanted to give satisfaction, to be as helpful to him as she had been to her father in the days before her disgrace, and more helpful, for he was so much kinder, he was so dear. For this extraordinary happiness, for this delicious safety from disapproval, from these free, fearless, wonderful days, she would give in return all she had, all she was, all she could teach herself and train herself to be. Nearly always Herr Dremmel went back to his laboratory about ten, and worked till after midnight, and she would lie awake in the funny bare bedroom across the passage as long as she could, so as not to miss too much of life by being asleep, smelling with the delight delicate sweet smells gave her the various fragrances of the resting garden. And the stars blinked in through the open window, and she could see the faint whiteness of a bush of Gulda roses against the curtain of the brooding night. When Herr Dremmel came in, he shut the window. On Sundays there was a service at two o'clock once a fortnight. On the alternating Sundays Herr Dremmel was driven by Johann to another village three miles distant, which was part of his scattered parish, and here he preached the sermon he had preached to Kokensee the Sunday before. He practiced a rigorous economy in sermons, and it had this advantage that an enthusiast, only there was no enthusiast, by waiting a week and 
walking three miles, most of which was deep sand, might hear again anything that had struck him the previous week. By waiting a year, indeed, the same enthusiast, supposing him there, could hear everything again, for Herr Dremmel's sermons numbered twenty-six, and were planned to begin on January 1st with the circumcision, and leaping along through the fortnights of the year ended handsomely and irregularly with an extra one at Christmas. However inattentive a member of the congregation might be, as the years passed over him, he knew the sermons. There were sermons weighty, according to the season, either with practical advice or with wrathful expositions of duty. There was one every year when the threshing time was at hand, on the text Micah chapter 4 verse 13 arise and thresh explaining with patient exactitude the newest methods of doing it there was the annual harvest thanksgiving sermon on matthew chapter 13 part of verse 26 tares after yet another year of the congregation's obstinate indifference to chemical manure there was the sermon on jeremiah chapter nine verse twenty two is there no physician there preached yearly on one of the later sundays in trinity when the cold continuous rains of autumn were finding out the weak spots in the parish's grandparents and the peasants having observed that once one called in a doctor the sick person got better and one had to pay the doctor into the bargain, evaded calling him in if they possibly could, inquiring of each other gloomily how one was to live if death was put a stop to. And there was the Advent sermon, when the annual slaughter of pigs drew near, on Isaiah 65, part of the fourth verse, Swine's Flesh this sermon filled the church in spite of the poor opinion of pigs in both the old and new testaments where herr dremmel found on searching for a text they were hardly mentioned except as convenient receptacles for devils in his parishioners lives they provided the nearest indeed the only approach to the finer emotions to gratitude love wonder the peasant watching this pink chalice of his future joys this mysterious moving crucible into which whatever dreary dregs and leavings he threw uttermost dregs of uttermost dregs that even his lean dog would not touch they still by christmas emerged as sausages could not but feel at least some affection at least some little touch of awe while his relations were ill and having to have either a doctor or a funeral and sometimes rousing him to fury both or if not ill were well and requiring food and clothing his pig walked about pink and naked giving no trouble needing no money spent on it placidly transmuting into the fat of future feastings that which without it would have become in heaps a source of flies and corruption. Herr Dremmel on pigs was full of intimacy and local warmth. He was more, he was magnificent. It was the sermon in the year which never failed to fill every seat, and it was the one day on which Kokensee felt its pastor thoroughly understood it. Ingeborg went diligently to church whenever there was church to go to, she explained to Herr Dremmel that she held it to be her duty as the pastor's wife to set an example in this matter, and he pinched her ear and replied that it might possibly be good for her German. He seemed to think nothing of her duty as a pastor's wife, and when she suggested that perhaps she ought to begin and go the rounds of the cottages and not wait for greater stores of language, he only remarked that little women's duty is to make their husbands happy. But don't I? 
she asked confidently, seizing his coat in both her hands. Of course, see how sleek I become. And I can do something besides that. Nothing so good, nothing half so good. But Robert, one thing doesn't exclude. Herr Dremmel had already, however, ceased to listen. His thoughts had slid off again. She seemed to sit in his mind on the top of a slope up which he occasionally clambered and caressed her. Eagerly on these visits she would buttonhole him with talk and ask him questions so that he might linger. But even while she buttonholed, his gaze would become abstracted and off he slid leaving her peering after him over the edge filled with a mixture of affection respect for his work pride in him and amusement end of section five